I think most stand-up specials feel like the special offers I get from spam emails. Where it's like, this is not a special offer for boner pills, this is just an offer. But one comic who always does feel distinct to me is Mike Birbiglia, and I think part of the reason why his work stands out is because it doesn't always feel like stand-up specials. Oh. <laughs> My experience of watching Mike actually feels closer to watching my favorite movies, but not because he lacks anything that I'd expect from stand-up. I think Mike has a higher joke quality and density than almost any other comedian I'd turn on. Things like, My wife and I hate going to parties, but we love driving away from parties. <laughs> Years ago, we went to our friend Katie's birthday, and this lady got up and gave a speech, which isn't a thing. She said, last year, Katie and I went scuba diving, and her oxygen tank got stuck on the rocks, and I wriggled it free, and I may have saved her life. I saved your best friend's life. Jenna, lock eyes from across the road, and we project the sentence. We're gonna talk about this for years. <laughs> It's actually sort of the opposite, where Mike's specials feel special because they give me something that other comedians don't, but my favorite movies often do, which are jokes inside of a larger framework that I care about. Watching Mike do stand-up feels like if the Pope shook your hand and palmed you a $20 bill. Like, I was already excited about the handshake. And so where other comedians might have viewed that as a self-contained anecdote, Birbiglia uses that entire bit as a setup to talk about how he struggled to bond with his new daughter in the same way that his wife did. Because this person who I've sworn to spend the rest of my life with, this person I've spent thousands of hours on a couch with who has saved my best friend's life, <laughs> is in the greatest love affair of her entire life that I'm watching through a window. And that dynamic between stories and jokes is what I love about my favorite movies and video games, but it can be hard to find in stand-up because of an unspoken rule that trying to do anything other than make the audience laugh all the time is a waste of time. And even though everyone knows the best part of stand-up comedy are its elaborate rules, Mike prefers asking the question, How can what I'm doing be helpful to the audience? As opposed to, oh, that was funny. You know, because walking away going, oh, that was funny. It, there's something about it that feels like it's a missed opportunity. Which I really connect with because the boo-hoo moments of my favorite movies don't make the tee-hee moments any less funny. And in the same way to me, Mike's backdrop of a failed relationship or a car crash or a bladder tumor don't either. When I was uh, 19, I had a malignant tumor in my bladder for about a week, but it's funny. <laughs> Stay with me. I even think Mike's development process feels closer to movies, where he spends about three years in 10 to 20 drafts between recorded specials. And in that time, he pumps out at least an hour of material every year. But like a samurai blacksmith folding over and tempering a katana made of dick jokes, Mike compresses those three hours into the one final hour that serves the show's thematic purpose. Because that's the ratio that it, it's gonna be. You're going to you're going to write about three hours of what you think is great and that about five minutes of that's worth worth showing an audience. But as great as the dick katana effect is, I don't think it fully explains why Mike's specials have the impact that they do. Because a big reason why I care about my favorite movies is because they're able to tap into a sense of a relationship with their audience. Like, at their best, I forget that I'm not actually in the Shire. Or on a beach with a shirtless Daniel Day-Lewis talking about the peach tree dance. Whereas with stand-up comedy, I, I grew up loving people like Jerry Seinfeld, but I was always very aware that he was the performer and I was the audience. But Mike blurs those lines by tapping into the type of jokes that can happen when you actually know someone. You know how sometimes you overlay pipe to explain a joke? Yep. I'm trying to get that out. I'm I, trying yeah. to get it to a point where, and I feel like you do this with your audiences when I've witnessed it, get to a point where it's all an inside joke, we're all friends. Well, last summer my wife and I went on a trip to Massachusetts, and I called it Catsachusetts, which is not funny, but in our house, what's the joke of the year? <laughs> the next day we drove home, and from that day forward we have called that state Massachusetts. <laughs> I want to point out something special that happened there at the end, which is a few minutes ago, I, I prefaced the story with a Massachusetts based upon Catsachusetts, which we all agreed as a group. Not funny. 
moments ago, I concluded the story with another Massachusetts-based pun. It was nearly identical. It was Massachusetts. But that time, we applauded. Which means, in a way, it's like we're married. And I started this video talking about how rare it is to feel strongly about stand-up specials nowadays, but Mike's specials hit me at a time during college when I didn't feel strongly about anything. They actually encouraged me to pursue writing instead of engineering, which is maybe something to reflect about, but engineering would have been a bad idea for me and for the people who would have gone on to use the bridges that I would have built. Mike Birbiglia might have saved thousands of lives by stopping me from becoming an engineer. And so I guess a more concise way to say what Mike did for those people is that I saved your best friend's life. They get liquored up and take them to the Peachtree Dance. <laughs>